Okay, so the main part of my talk is going to be about my research in the area of stainless steel structures. And what I'm going to do first is try to put things uh, into context by saying a little bit about the, the basic characteristics of stainless steel. So stainless steel is widely used across a, a range of industries, and you guys would have come across it in your everyday life in the, forms of, in the form of pots and pans and cutlery and this kind of thing. It's the general name given to a family of corrosion-resisting steels that were invented just over 100 years ago. And the invention was pretty much simultaneous from an English metallurgist called Harry Brearley and some German scientists. So you can think of it as kind of a, a joint discovery between the two countries. I, I like to think we, we got there first. <laughs> now, the main alloying elements that you um, add to iron to make um, stainless steel are chromium and nickel. And typical percentages are 18% chromium and 8% nickel. Now, this, these percentages can be varied to give a range of different properties uh, suitable for different applications and different environments. The key incentive to uh, specify stainless steel as a structural material is the corrosion resistance. And the key disincentive is the initial material cost, with stainless steel costing between about two and a half and six times the cost of ordinary steel. But if you think about things on a whole life basis, the total cost of the structure, then things look a lot more attractive. So this is uh, a nice example illustrating the potential durability benefits of stainless steel. So there's two piers here in Mexico. The one in the background is uh, reinforced with stainless steel reinforcement and was built in 1943. The one in the foreground was reinforced with carbon steel, ordinary steel reinforcement, and was built in 1969 and is clearly some way past its best. Okay, looking at the the cost of a structure. So the total cost of a carbon steel structure, an ordinary steel structure, and a stainless steel structure. If we look at just the initial material cost, so that's the orange bits, stainless steel is going to be much more expensive than carbon steel. But if you consider the additional costs that build up over the life of the structure, due to things like inspection, maintenance, repair, repainting, stainless steel becomes uh, a lot more attractive. And depending on the application, the additional costs will also include things like plant closures, traffic delays, uh, and so on. Now, what uh, much of my work is about is trying to improve the efficiency of the design of the stainless steel structure. And what that does is it cuts down the initial material costs, and then hopefully will make things look uh, more promising overall. And that's really the, the theme of the talk. Stainless steel has been used in a number of applications. This is an example of an external facade supporting system on a building in Helsinki. It's been used in a number of footbridges, and uh, here you're sort of using the design life, the long design life, the aesthetics, the durability of the material. And more recently, it's been used in longer span footbridges and even uh, road bridges. The color of the sky there indicating the location of the structure. <laughs> Basic uh, mechanical properties, so Young's modulus and the yield strength of stainless steel are broadly similar to ordinary carbon steel, but the form of the stress-strain curve is fundamentally different. <coughs> so ordinary carbon steel has a, a sharply defined yield point, followed by a, a flat yield plateau and then some strain hardening later on. Stainless steel exhibits a much more rounded stress-strain response with significant strain hardening. And design codes that are used to design both carbon steel and stainless steel structures are based on an elastic, perfectly plastic material model. That fits ordinary steel quite well, but it doesn't fit well with stainless steel. And this extra strength due to strain hardening is something that is not well captured by current design guidance. And I'll talk about our approach to solving that uh, later on. OK, so moving on to our research. So much of the work of my research group is ultimately aimed at the development of structural design rules. So that's uh, what's indicated on the box there on the right. 
And then various things need to feed into that, including resistance functions, which need to be based on, on sound theory. <coughs> and also the resistance functions need to be uh, underpinned and validated against the results of physical tests and numerical simulations. And of course, the design rules need to be reliable so that they can be safely used in practice. So each of these components is what um, makes up the main parts of my talk. So I'm starting with experiments. So we're very lucky at Imperial. We've got excellent uh, laboratory testing facilities. And all of the work that I show in the next few slides uh, were was carried out in the structures lab in the, in the Skempton building. So I'll show you some uh, material testing, some strength enhancements that you uh, generate during section forming, some member tests, and some elevated temperature tests. So establishing the basic stress strain characteristics of the material is, in, in principle, relatively straightforward, but it, it's so important because all of your subsequent member test results are normalized back to the, the measured material properties. So it's important that it's done um, accurately. Here I've shown a typical stress strain curve, uh, in, which is the, the blue line from a tensile coupon test. And there's also another curve which is basically overlapping, which is a model, um, a material model, which has been fitted to this uh, coupon test. And this is the, the form of that model. So it's a two-stage ramberg osgood model, which we developed at Imperial in conjunction with some researchers at UPC in Barcelona. And you saw that the, the model can accurately capture the observed stress-strain response. You can apply it in both tension and compression. And it's now been widely used by others in their numerical simulations and analytical models. Now, the dominant product form for stainless steel elements are cold formed sections. This means that flat sheet material is plastically deformed at room temperature into the final cross section shape. And that plastic deformation induces strength enhancements during the forming process. And these strength enhancements are particularly substantial for stainless steel because of the high strain hardening that the material exhibits. So we've done, uh, firstly, work on measuring these strength enhancements, and then secondly, on developing predictive tools so that des the designers can actually harness these strength enhancements and use them in their design calculations rather than just base their designs on the strength of the flat material, which will be lower. So we've cut a range of structural stainless steel cross sections into a series of strips, and then we've performed tensile coupon tests on those strips. And that's enabled us to build up a profile of strength around the different cross sections. This is an example of uh, one of the measurements. So on the uh, right hand side there, the, the red curve represents the, the strength that a designer would get from the material standard. So that will be the sort of lowest value that they, they will get. The blue line, that represents the strength of the flat sheet prior to section forming. And that will always be a little bit higher than the minimum specified value in the material standard. And then the black line represents the actual strength of the final formed section. And that's the strength that we want to capture and enable our designers to, to use it. So we've developed mechanically based predictive models. And we've verified these models against our collected test results. And basically, the model involves a two-step process. You firstly estimate the amount of plastic strain that goes into the section during section forming. And that's just based on the final geometry of the cross section. And then you determine the stress corresponding to this plastic strain from the material model. And that is used as the enhanced yield strength. And to give you an idea of the uh, level of enhancements that you can get, for box sections, it's about 30% on average increase in strength in the flat regions and about 50% in the corner regions. These models are now in UK guidance, and so designers can uh, make use of them. OK, moving on to uh, tests on stainless steel elements. This, this is really fundamental experimental data, and it's really, really valuable for underpinning design rules, for validating finite element models, 
And, but they've really uh, got to be uh, rather carefully conducted and really fully reported. And the reason for that is if you have data uh, which is published, which has got some missing information, then it'll be far less value for, yet valuable for other people. So it's really a case of uh, quality rather than quantity, I think. We've carried out a series of column buckling tests on different stainless steel profiles, different stainless steel grades. We've used these results to validate finite element models and also to underpin new design guidance. And as well as room temperature testing, we've also done some elevated temperature testing. So stainless steel loses strength and stiffness at elevated temperature, and this has implications on structural fire design. Now we've derived strength and stiffness reduction factors for uh, different grades of stainless steel, which are now included in, in various forms of design guidance. Now in the important temperature range for structural fire design, which is around six to 900 degrees centigrade, stainless steel retains its strength to a much higher degree than ordinary carbon steel, and that can bring some real benefits in certain applications. Now, as well as excellent facilities, you've got to have uh, very good technical to su support in order to make uh, good progress in the lab. This uh, chap in the foreground is Gordon, who I've been working with for about 10 years, and then Les more recently in the background. And I'm very grateful for all of their help and expertise over the years. Okay, moving on to the uh, next topic, so finite element simulations. So finite element modeling is uh, unquestionably a, a very powerful tool, particularly when used in combination with testing. It's very widely used in research, and it's becoming more and more widely used in practice. You can consider far more scenarios than you could possibly consider in practice in the, in the lab. You can carry out sensitivity studies. You can examine the kind of what-if scenarios. What if you remove uh, residual stresses uh, from your structural cross-sections? Very difficult to do in practice without affecting other things. Easy to look at in numerical modeling. There is a cost associated with finite element modeling, um, particularly in terms of time. So you shouldn't just be running as many mo models as possible, and you should be trying to fully utilize the, the computational resources that you've got. And what that really means is, even if you're not working at the weekend, your computer should be. <laughs> OK, the models have got to be sufficiently sophisticated to capture the observed physical behavior. So you've got to give uh, care and thought to the main input parameters. So the material model is important. And we use the uh, two-stage Ramberg-Osgood model that I spoke about earlier. Corner strength enhancements for cold form sections should be included. Residual stresses need to be given due consideration. And then imperfections. These should really be of the, the shape and magnitude that you're likely to see in practice. And you should make sure that you're not artificially suppressing certain buckling modes. And then a crucial part of any numerical study is the, the validation of the finite element models. And this doesn't just mean comparing your model against one or two tests and looking at the peak load and uh, tuning your imperfections in order to get the right answer. It means being able to capture the observed physical behavior, the initial stiffness, the form of the load deformation response, peak load, and also the unloading behavior of the uh, structural sections and getting the right failure mode as well. So it's all about getting the right answers for the right reason and developing confidence in your model so you can then go on and carry out parametric studies to generate more data. OK, I've got uh, three examples of where we've done some finite element modeling and we've validated our models against existing tests. So in this case, we've got stainless steel cross sections under combined axial force and bending. We validated our models, and then we used the model results in order to um, develop some structural design rules on, on this subject. Second topic, we looked at cyclic member testing and, and modeling, and we showed that there was real potential for improved energy absorption when using stainless steel for the key uh, dissipative elements in seismic resistant structures. 
we had a more refined mesh in the area where we, where we were expecting the most uh, deformation. And we were able to accurately replicate the hysteretic response and also the test failure mode. And then the final example is our most recent study. We looked at uh, shear buckling of stainless steel plate girders. And this was really in response to people using stainless steel in heavier and heavier structural applications, things like bridges, and plate girders are, are needed in order to carry high loads over long spans. So we were using a combination of physical testing and numerical modeling. That was used to underpin design, um, design guidance. And that design guidance is now included in the 2015 revision of Eurocode 3, part 1.4. OK, moving on to design rules. So, so far I've spoken really about uh, physical testing and numerical modelling. In this section I'm talking about how we've used those tests and models in order to uh, underpin and develop structural design rules. And in particular, I'll be talking about uh, a deformation-based design framework which we refer to as the continuous strength method, and this was developed at Imperial. So there's a number of existing international stainless steel design standards, and all of them were either introduced or substantially revised over the past five to 10 years. So this really indicates that there is a lot of research activity and also a lot of interest uh, from practice. In Europe, the uh, rules for stainless steel structures are given in Eurocode 3, part 1.4. And this was a huge step forward when this was published in 2006 for just for the visibility of stainless steel and also for, for promoting more uh, widespread use. Now, as far as possible, when this standard was written, the idea was to harmonize the rules with the existing rules for ordinary carbon steel. And the idea behind this was that this should enable an easy transition for designers who are familiar with carbon steel across to stainless steel design. So that was the idea, but in some areas, that's really at the expense of efficiency of material use. So some of the design rules are overly conservative, and if you've got an expensive material, you want to be using it as efficiently as possible. So I've got uh, a few slides here which basically summarize what is the uh, shortcoming with existing standards, and then how we address that uh, with our new deformation-based design method. So as we saw earlier, stainless steel has got a nice rounded stress-strain curve with substantial strain hardening. But current design codes are based on the assumption of elastic, perfectly plastic material behavior. And that's the stress-strain curve that I show in that picture. Now, if we consider a cross-section under compressive load, with that idealized material model, if the cross-section fails at the yield strain, and the corresponding stress will be the yield stress, and the compressive resistance will be cross-sectional area times yield stress. This is known as the yield load. If the cross-section is quite stocky, and it can deform a long way along the stress-strain curve, it will get to high strains. But with this material model, it doesn't result in any increase in strength. So your resistance is still given by the yield load. So in compression, increasing deformation with this material model doesn't result in increasing resistance. Now the real material looks much more like this. Lots of strain hardening, and the essence of this curve can be captured with an elastic linear hardening material model. If your cross-section fails at the yield strain, again, your resistance will be given by the yield load, area times yield strength. But now, if you've got a stocky cross-section that can deform along the stress-drain curve uh, because local buckling is suppressed, now increasing deformation also brings increasing resistance. And the increase in resistance will be dependent on how far you can deform along the stress-drain curve and also the slope of the strain-hardening region. So in reality, increasing deformation does result in increasing resistance. So that's for the case of compression. If you look at the same idea, but this time in bending, 
So with the idealized material model, if you fail at the yield strain, then the corresponding bending moment capacity is the elastic moment capacity, and this is assigned to what are known as class three cross-sections in the Euro codes. If your cross-section can deform along the stress-drain curve because it's suitably stocky, you can get to the idealized case at infinite strain of the plastic moment capacity. So there's no increase in stress, but the stress spreads through the depth of the cross-section. Now, we know that the real stress-strain curve, again, has got this hardening uh, behavior. If the cross-section fails at the yield strain, then we have the corresponding yield moment. So that's, that's an OK concept. But now, as the cross-section deforms along the stress-strain curve, we now can get stresses higher than the yield stress, moments uh, much higher than the elastic and even the plastic moment capacity. And capacity is dependent on how far your cross-sections can deform along that curve. OK, so that's the sort of uh, background to um, the shortcomings with the current design approach. Now let's look at some data. So this graph shows the ultimate load achieved in a compression test of a short series of short stainless steel columns normalized by the yield load. And that's plotted against the slenderness of the cross-section, which is about the susceptibility to local buckling. Now, we're interested in the data down the left-hand end of this graph, where the resistance is limited to the yield load, area times yield strength. But the actual capacities that you see in the tests are 20 30% above this value. Now, we want to capture that strength, and we know that it's uh, there because of strain hardening. If you look at the same thing in bending, so now we've got the moment capacity from a series of bending tests normalized by the plastic moment capacity of the cross-section. The test data shows that because of strain hardening, we can get substantially in excess of the uh, current code provisions. So there's the evidence that there is a problem. And here's the uh, observations. So current design provisions uh, for stainless steel stocky sections are overly conservative. The current classification framework, and in particular this elastic, perfectly plastic material model, doesn't match well with the actual material characteristics of stainless steel. We've got to include strain hardening if we want an efficient design. And these observations led us to the uh, development of the deformation-based continuous strength method. So this slide talks about how the method works. So it's uh, a fairly radical departure from the uh, current practice. We have two components in the continuous strength method. The first one on the left-hand side is what we call the base curve. And the base curve defines how much strain your cross-section can endure before failure by local buckling. And that's plotted against the um, local, local cross-section slenderness. So we have a simple relationship between limiting strain and cross-section slenderness. And using this base curve replaces cross-section classification. So you know how much strain your cross-section can take. The second part of the design method is then to use a strain hardening material model. Take your strain, find the corresponding stress, and this uh, stress is what you can use in your design calculations. The slope of the linear hardening region of the curve uh, relates to the basic properties of the material, with some grades having high strain hardening slopes and other grades having much lower slopes. These are the steps that a designer would do. So step one, they would work out their cross-section slenderness, and this is in the, the normal way. They would then find how much deformation capacity their cross-section uh, has from that base curve. They then use the material model to find the stress corresponding to that strain. And then the cross-section resistance in compression is that stress multiplied by the cross-sectional area. So that's for compression. If you look in bending, the limiting strain now applies to the outer fiber of the cross-section in compression. You then have a, the corresponding stress distribution from the same linear hardening material model. And then your moment capacity 
is the integral of the stress multiplied by the lever arm over the area of the cross section. And that can be approximated by a relatively simple um, expression for CSM moment capacity. I say relatively simple because although it looks a little bit long, there's just three simple numbers that you need to put into here. First one is the strain hardening modulus um, relative to the Young's modulus of the material. The second number is just based on the geometry of the cross section, and it's one over the shape factor. And the third number is the strain ratio. So this is how much strain your cross section can endure as a multiple of the yield strain taken from the base curve. So again, the steps for calculating the resistance of a stainless steel element in bending. First step, same as before, calculate your cross-section slenderness, now for the section in bending. Second step, go to the same base curve and see how much strain your cross-section can endure. And then finally, you use the CSM moment capacity expression to get your resistance. So what we found is that the, the CSM yields uh, considerably more accurate and less scattered strength predictions in compression and bending compared to existing uh, design approaches. So we then moved on to look at combined loading, and that's the data that I've got in this graph. So here I've got the ultimate moment and ultimate axial force achieved in a series of tests, normalized by the Eurocode 3 endpoints of the yield load and the plastic moment capacity. And what you can see is that the data is firstly very scattered and also quite far from the design interaction curve. So that shows that the current provisions are uh, conservative and also scattered. And the reason for it is that the stockier cross sections are furthest out from the interaction curve, and that's because they're limited uh, to the yield stress. We're ignoring strain hardening in current design uh, codes, but in fact, there's an awful lot of strain hardening, which is giving them that extra strength. Now, if you take exactly the same data, but you simply normalize it by the CSM endpoints rather than the Eurocode endpoints, the data becomes in a much, much tighter band and becomes closer to the design curve. And that's showing that we've got a more rational and a more accurate and consistent design method. So our, our proposal is that we use the existing interaction curves, their shape, but we simply change the endpoints to the CSM endpoints. So overall, CSM offers, on average, about 20% increase in capacity, up to about 35% for some cross sections. You get safe side predictions and a, re a reduction in scatter. There's no real increase in calculation effort. It's a different approach, but it's not a, a more complicated approach. And we've demonstrated that you also get reliable outcomes according to a, a statistical analysis. Now, what's happening to the CSM? So it's been the subject of two prize-winning journal papers. It is now included in the recent AISC, which is the North American uh, Design Guide for Stainless Steel. It's included in UK guidance, and it's also being used um, by some companies in the UK. So really what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to expand the range of application of the method, and that's the subject of ongoing research. And I see that the, the resulting material savings, coupled with these strength enhancements that you can get from section forming, can really help to promote the wider use of uh, stainless steel. Now, this is where I see the main impact is of our research. OK, talking about impact, I'm going to say a few sort of more general uh, comments about uh, the subject of impact. So REF and the funding bodies, rightly in my view, are placing increasing emphasis on impact. That means, is our research actually being used uh, for benefit in practice? Now, I think this is right, but we've also got to be careful that we're not just considering short-term uh, impact. Similar to what our, our president said a, a week or two ago, we've got to have the, the confidence to carry out the kind of fundamental research where we might not see the benefits uh, for many years to come. I still think you should have 
impact in your mind when you're doing uh, this kind of research, uh, though it might not come to fruition for some time. Also, when we're disseminating our work, so clearly four-star journal papers are the name of the game, uh, but the kind of people that we want to impact upon might not be reading journal papers. So I think we really need to go out there and spread the good word, uh, talk at conferences, uh, and I think, by the way, hosting conferences is also a good for, the, for an institution. Uh, getting involved writing textbooks and design guides, which practicing engineers will be uh, reading. Presenting to engineers. Uh, getting involved through the institutions. And in, in my area, design codes. These are really the key vehicles for um, ensuring that structural engineering research can impact on practice. And what's useful here is to get involved with the code committees. And if you're involved in the European code committees, you'll want to take lessons in international diplomacy. Uh, but it is, uh, is definitely something that's worth uh, getting to know the process. And in my view, impact doesn't generally just happen. We need to go out and um, put our case forward and try and make things happen. Okay, I'm now going to move on to a few uh, more general aspects. So I'm going to say a few words about uh, these different topics, teaching, professional institutions, the strategic think tank, research groups, and there are a couple of bonus slides. Okay, so teaching. As uh, Nick said, I've been director of undergraduate studies in the uh, department for five years, and so I've given a, a little bit of thought to, to teaching. And we all know that universities have got two primary roles, teaching and research. I think they're both equally important. I also think that the attributes for high quality delivery of the two are, are pretty complementary. So you need to have, obviously, technical knowledge of your subject, meticulousness, organization, enthusiasm, clarity of expression, all of these kind of things. And no one forgets a good lecturer. And we influence hundreds of students every year. And of course, we want that influence uh, not just to be one of imparting knowledge, but also hopefully one of <coughs> inspiration. We want to inspire people to, to go out and uh, design exciting structures, for example, or uh, we might inspire one or two of them to do a PhD. We don't want to inspire too many of them into banking. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should be talking about our research in, in, our, in our lectures to some extent. And I do like the uh, latest CivSoc initiative of organizing uh, research talks to the students so that the students know what we spend much of our time doing. Now, a good time to get to know the students and for them to really contribute to ongoing research is during their final year and MSc dissertations. These are really important. Here's a happy MSc student who helped in the lab, though it's not a good idea to put your hand in the testing machine. <laughs> OK, the professional institutions. So I'm thinking in, in my area of iStruct e and ICE, I think these guys have got a, a really key role to play in enhancing the link between academia and practice and facilitating impact. I'm engaged with the institutions in various ways, but it's really uh, in two roles where I'm, um, my efforts to try and enhance this link between ac academia and practice. So through the research panel, and also as editor of the new uh, journal of the Institution of Structural Engineers called Structures. And here I think we've got unique access via the iStruct members to really try and um, channel and enhance this impact. A strategic education and research think tank. Now Nick actually alluded to this earlier on. We meet uh, twice daily for high level discussions in the common room of the Skempton building. And uh, this, is the, <laughs> this is the strategic think tank. Uh, I didn't realize I'd got a little bit of a reputation, but I'm glad I'm in the top three. Um, <laughs> we are, of course, the, the Coffee Break Club. And uh, we don't have that high level uh, discussions, uh, but we do have a, a bit of a chat. And it is uh, rather nice to be able to sit down um, once or twice a day and take a bit of a break uh, with some friends. So I'd like to say thank you to the uh, strategic think tank 
and I believe our next meeting is tomorrow morning. <laughs> OK, we all know that PhD students are at the heart of every uh, successful research team. I think it's up to us as the academics to really set the standards, lead by example, instill the right levels of meticulousness and so on. But it is really the, the hard work, the ideas and dedication of PhD students that really enable us to get things done. So I'd like to say thank you to all my hardworking PhD students. I also think that the, the best environment for research is a, a nice, happy, vibrant research group where we're sharing ideas, uh, celebrating achievements. There's a few prizes being dished out here. And just enjoying working together and having a bit of fun. And I, th I think our best ideas often come not when we're working flat out, but when we're having a little bit of, of downtime. That's my excuse, anyway. <laughs> OK, my former PhD student. So I'm very um, privileged to have worked with some uh, very, very bright students. And so far, 20 have um, completed their PhD under my supervision. Now, 15 of them are now in the academic world. I'm not sure whether that is success or failure. Um, ten of them are lecturers, and a number of them are, are here today, and a couple of them claim to be watching on the Imperial College YouTube channel. So <laughs> we'll see. Uh, some of these students have been uh, co-supervised. I'll mention the, the co-supervisors in a minute. Uh, five of my uh, former students are now in, in the real world, as you might call it, uh, designing structures, and uh, including its top London consultancies, so Bureau Happold and WSP. One out of 20 has deviated slightly from the structural engineering world. He's gone into real estate. Um, <laughs> nothing too wrong with that. OK, my current PhD students. So again, I'm very lucky to be working with a, a very bright uh, group of people. Uh, the stars next to the names, by the way, are indicating co-supervisors. And I should say thank you to all of the co-supervisors, David, Aimer, Lorenzo, Ahmed, Shada, and Finian. There's the research group having one of our um, dinners, which we do occasionally. Uh, most of the group are there, except the sort of um, newly arrived people. There's always somebody who comes along just for the free dinner. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> Professor Amar Wadi is the person in question. OK, we're on to uh, bonus slide territory now. So research is, of course, a serious business. Our graduation day is a, is a serious event and coming up soon. And international conferences shouldn't be seen simply as a, a chance to go to exotic locations and to, to lark around. So I've got some examples of the kind of behavior that I really don't like to see. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here, but I don't like to see that. And uh, <laughs> if this is the future of structural engineering at Imperial, we, we could be in trouble. <laughs> I'm going back to the, the title of the talk, so Iron Man. I said it also relates to a little bit of a hobby of mine, which is triathlon. Now, triathlon is a, a three-stage uh, race which involves first swimming, then cycling, and then finishing off with the run. Now, and also the, the blue arrows are indicating the transition between the uh, different stages, which are also very much part of the race. So there is, of course, a, a clear analogy with PhD research. And uh, this is to enhance the, the relevance of this slide. <laughs> so... Um, Three disciplines to a triathlon, three years to a PhD. Year one, sink or swim. <laughs> year two, the, the hard yards. And then year three, sprint finish. More painful for some than others. <laughs> and if you're in year four, probably you've spent too long in the transition zone. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's various analogies for what the transition zone might represent. 
Okay, quite an extreme version of a triathlon is called an Ironman triathlon, and that involves a 3.8 kilometer swim, 180 kilometer cycle, and then finish with a marathon. So uh, last year, last summer, my wife and I competed in Ironman Switzerland and completed the event as the bike. So uh, being Switzerland, it was quite hilly. One of the hills was called the Beast. Uh, this, this hill was called Heartbreak Hill, and you can probably just about see by the expression on my face, it's having the desired effect. <laughs> this is me at the finish, looking fairly relieved. Um, and that was after 11 hours and 45 minutes. And this is shortly after the uh, post-race team photo with Catherine and I. So it was uh, smiling there, by the way, to try and mask the pain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but really quite some day. OK, that's the end of the uh, bonus slides. And I'm now going to come on to my conclusions. So research and the use of stainless steel has increased significantly over the last decade. Availability of structural design rules have been a huge step forward. And now, um, more efficient design methods recognizing the particular characteristics of the material are starting to reach design codes and practice. And I feel that this greater efficiency is really the opportunity to promote um, more widespread use of the material. We should be thinking also about our future needs and for sure our resilient structures that are, are durable and resistant to extreme events are going to be needed more and more and I think stainless steel's got an excellent blend of properties to help meet these uh, future demands. Of course, there's always more work to be done there. And then some more uh, general conclusions. So I've been talking mainly about uh, experimental and numerical research and the development of, of structural design rules, the need to be thorough and meticulous. And of course, that applies to all types of research. It takes time to, to do things properly. I spoke about impact, and I really think with impact, it generally doesn't just happen. It's up to us to, to get out there, spread the good word, and really promote that impact. I'd like to reiterate my thanks to my students, colleagues, friends, and collaborators, and really reinforce the fact, the point that uh, the caliber of staff and students at Imperial really do make it a, a fantastic place to work. Um, but it's not all about working, and there is always time for a little bit of fun. Thank you all very much. <laughs>